thank you all very much for having me. It's, it's an honor. And again, I'm here today to talk to you about 10 tips for growing your, your senior business via the social web. My name is David Weigel. I am the chief marketing strategist and one of the partners with Immersion Active. I'll tell you a little bit about us in a second. And I'm also the co-author of a book called Dot Boom, Marketing to Baby Boomers Through Meaningful Online Engagement. I thought I would kind of um, set up our time today or kind of set a theme here with this uh, quote from Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So this will be a, a bit of a theme as I talk to you today. And what I have to present to you today, I've got three quick stats, so I won't bore you with uh, too much data. And then I'm going to share with you a little bit the, the evolution that's taking place in marketing as kind of a setup for the 10 tips that I want to present to you today. Just very quickly uh, about um, myself and, and, and my company, um, Immersion Active is the only interactive agency in the United States that is solely focused on the boomer and senior markets. We've been around since 1998, uh, about Six years ago now, we saw much of what we did as becoming a commodity and decided to narrow our focus on uh, these consumers. Our work in includes um, work with clients such as AARP, Dell Web, um, Senior Lending Network, Home Instead Senior Care, about a dozen CCRCs, uh, some financial institutions. So uh, we cross a, a variety of industries but have a very narrow focus on on um, a consumer in the second half of life and the use of engaging them via digital media. How are we doing, Dennis? Do I still sound okay? Uh, the sound is great, uh, David. Sound is great. You may want to <laughs> click that, uh, click that uh, audio uh, thing in the back, audio uh, thing that, that back. dim dim okay. sign on the bottom of the screen. Is that out of the way now? All right. If you click that pause, it'll if disappear all together. I'm nervous, nervous to do that. I'll just kind of scoot it out of the way. I don't want to mess this up. Okay. okay. Um, okay. Ju just uh, briefly about our book. Again, uh, my business partner and I came out with this book uh, called Dot Boom. It's been a little over a year now. It was based on about 18 months worth of work. It was a real team effort. And if I had to sum up the book, um, I would say it's, it's, it's one part um, insight on human behavior and uh, one part, um, you know, digital media strategy. And what we saw as a real problem in, in our industry was um, as technology allowed us to do more and more, we kind of got away from um, our understanding of the consumer. So we kind of brought it back to that. There's a lot of insight and, and um, uh, findings in there that go back to uh, Carl Jung, Eric Erickson, um, more, more contemporary, uh, David Wolf. And then uh, we combined that with um, some strategies that you can use um, that will allow you to replicate your success in engaging uh, a boomer or a senior for that matter, um, someone in the second half of life. Frankly, we named it Dot Boom just because um, there's a lot of attention on boomers, but really we kind of take an, an ageless approach um, that's aimed at understanding um, ourselves better and then apply a lens of how can we uh, um, more meaningfully uh, engage with an older consumer specifically. So just briefly about me, um, I have uh, many women in my life as you see here and uh, this kind of plays out as our presentation goes on, but the women in my life are all internet users that you're seeing here, and they're all online for different reasons and some similar reasons, but they all represent a different season of life, which we're going to talk about. So my daughter, Madison, who is 12, my wife, who uh, is just turned 40, my mother-in-law, who I affectionately call Moosh, who is um, in the fall of her life, and she is just turning 60 or 64, and then um, my great Nana, who is uh, 94. So uh, each of these women have a slightly different reason for being online and motivation, and um, I'll kind of uh, hopefully share that with you over the course of today's presentation. I want to let you know before I go any further here, um, 
I usually do these presentations live. I do some webinars. I host a webinar um, for an organization called the International Mature Marketing Network. Um, but I don't like having uh, the, the feedback. So feel free to pose questions as we go along. Uh, I'm imagining Dennis can relay those to me and I'm, I'm happy to answer those or to direct my presentation to be more relevant for you and meaningful for you guys. So in this case, I'm not going to get to learn a whole lot about you, but you feel free to tell me about yourself and I'll uh, see how that applies to our conversation. So three quick stats that I promised you. Uh, this may or may not, these may or may not come as a surprise to you. The first is that boomers and seniors make up the largest and fastest growing constituency online. So they're in the United States, which most of my stats are based on, there are about 178 million active users. About a third of those are boomers and seniors. Boomers outspend younger adults online two to one on a per capita basis. And this is from some Forrester research and I, I like to share this because there's um, uh, you know a widely held belief that older uh, older adults and I use that relative to the, the only group of adults Madison Avenue is still concerned about, which is 18 to 35. Um, older adults, um, and maybe that they're not engaged online, or worst case, that they're scared and simply not spending money, and that's definitely not the case. The problem is, is that as marketers, we've been too ignorant to acknowledge how they're engaging online. So that'll be one of the things we talk about today. And then some fairly recent research here, all of this is fairly recent, but this is in the past six months. Um, boomers now spend as much time online as they do watching TV. And I know we're talking about seniors today. Um, this is relevant though, because as many of you probably know, uh, the first of the boomers will turn 65 uh, starting this January. And so that's significant for a lot of reasons, but that is the point at which the boomer generation will officially start becoming seniors, whether they want to call themselves that or not. And historically, the boomers have been known as the uh, TV generation. And so the fact that they are spending as much time online now as watching TV is, is very, very relevant. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. The most obvious one that I will share with you so that you don't take this information um, out of context is that video has become um, so accessible online and that's um, uh, a, a big part of the reason that boomers are spending more time online is because they're consuming video that they might have otherwise watched on television. So I want to give you just a little history lesson here. Um, to give you some sense for where we're at and uh, hopefully uh, build up your courage in terms of what needs to be done to effectively reach uh, an older consumer. <clears throat> the, the first thing, um, well, let me take you back here a little bit. So late 1800s, early 1900, Richard Sears um, did something that was really pretty um, earth shattering in terms of, of marketing and that is that um, he gave the consumer an alternative to pricier rural bricks and mortar stores by delivering the store to them in the form of a catalog and this was considered to be pretty rogue at the time um, but as we all know um, that that caught on and was very successful for a number of years <clears throat> The next big milestone that's worth sharing with you that, that's probably going to seem like a no-brainer is, you know, around the 40s and 50s with the advent of broadcast media and television in particular, <clears throat> for which we went from uh, being a society for which uh, you could be successful based on your manufacturing prowess to one for which you could take an idea and you could broadcast it out there. And if you had a unique idea and if you could get it out there, if you could hit them hard enough with that idea, um, if you could yell that idea a little bit louder across the room, then you had a good chance of success. And a lot of that success was based on the places, if you will, that you, um, you were able to display your, your advertising. And, um, you know, that's not to say that mass marketing is dead. I don't want anybody to walk away from this conversation thinking that's the case, 
but there, there is an evolution that's taking place, and I want to explain to you why that is, because um, my understanding of our, our audience today is that maybe we have a lot of um, small business people who are representing products and services to a senior market, and this paradigm is still very much entrenched, and that is if I can be in the right yellow, you know, in the right place in the yellow pages, in the right books, you know, if I can uh, be on the right radio station, on the right um, TV channels, and so forth, um, that that I can uh, win this market. And among other uh, potential problems with this, one that you're going to see is that. Um, you have to be really careful now because you never know when you'll get yourself into an unfortunate juxtaposition, as this slide shows, if you just, um, you know, suggest that uh, by being in a certain place, I can um, get the attention and win the trust of my audience. And in this case, I'm sure you can see where this could affect the trust or uh, of the audience that you're trying to reach. And ultimately, what we've tried to, to do, and this is a, a criticism of my own industry is um, ultimately what we've tried to do it, as marketers is hypnotize our our um, our consumers and our prospects uh, into the middle into the same sea of sameness as we say um, such that they they buy into our product but ultimately what we've tried to do is make everything so mainstream that um, we seem like everybody else and so we really had to look for tricky ways to um, kind of win, win our consumers over and ultimately what we've ended up with especially with the advent of and, and maturation of the internet is, is spam and that's what uh, your consumers are feeling like with regards to most of the, um, the forms of um, solicitation and sales that you're sending their way so what is it about now? So a lot of what our book talks about picks up on, um, uh, in particular, Seth Godin's ideas. And one idea in particular is this notion of tribes. So in uh, Seth's books, Tribes, um, We Need You to Lead Us, this is what he says. This is what matters now is this notion of tribes. And I want to explain that to you. You know, we've always been inclined to move in masses and to connect with each other and to help solve each other's problems, whether that's um, you know from a religious standpoint or for a certain cause, um, as is the case here. Um, uh, but this happens, um, you know, in, in, in capitalism as well. And what you're seeing here is uh, Southwest blog, for which they in fact have done a good job of of building a tribe. And you might say, yeah, but they've got something cool they're doing there or whatever. But there are a lot of companies that have done this. Um, Dove with their pro-age campaign, they did it around beauty, this notion of connecting people um, uh, based on needs that they have already. And you know, ultimately, these guys are selling soap. So uh, what I want you to take away from this is that this notion of creating tribes and being a leader of a tribe isn't reserved for just the sexy and outstanding and unusual products. Um, it can be something as boring and simple um, as soap. But any, any tribe, any movement that has ever um, come about has, um, had one, has required one thing, and that is a leader. And, um, you know, leaders take many shapes and sizes. Um, but ultimately, leaders are connecting people. They're not inventing something new. They're connecting people, like I said a second ago, based on an existing need that they have. So regardless of your political affiliation, I, sure, I, I imagine everybody on, online today will agree that Barack Obama did not create the notion of hope, nor did Rush Limbaugh create the conservative right wing. Um, so, so, you know, this, this notion that you have to speak to everybody is really the worst, um, the worst thing you can do at this point when in fact really what it takes is a certain percentage of that. It takes a small group of very well connected people. We'll talk about how this plays out online. Because ultimately what happens is if you can get a small tribe of people and then you can move on and, or they will be inclined to move on on their own and create another tribe and so on and so on 
you can establish yourself as a market leader. And ultimately, as the one that um, leads these movements, if you will, and I know that sounds overstated, but that's what we're talking about, that leads these movements, wins the trust. And I'm sure everyone on the phone line, if you've at all looked into or have experience in, in marketing to um, you know, an older adult, you know that, that trust is key. And so that's, that's what we're going for here. It's a, a more potent way to reach our consumers that's trustworthy and credible. So I'm going to uh, get into my 10 tips here. Dennis, let me ask you at this point, do you take questions along the way or have you had anybody or do you have any, any indication that everybody's fallen asleep on me? <laughs> I don't think they're falling asleep, but if anybody wants to uh, forward Dennis a question, I'll relay that to, uh, to David right, and just send going. it to the society. Um, so I'm going to roll into my 10 tips here. And, and these tips revolve around how you need to think about marketing to an adult over 50 in general, but specifically for the web as well. There's some unique things to the web here. And, and instead of talking about social networks specifically, which I will touch on, we're talking about the social web. That is to say, the fact that when we go online now, it's not just me, a single user, having a single session that's an island from every other user out there and every other session, that we are all now interconnected in our online activity. So my first tip for everyone is to, or suggestion is to rethink segmentation. And basically what this quote from uh, the Harvard Business Review suggests that um, in light of the economy, you need to rethink how you're slicing up your, your prospects and how you're communicating with them. So that's the notion of segmentation if you're not an uh, uh, experienced marketer. And um, this is something actually we've been preaching um, even prior to the downturn in the economy. And there's some really good reasons for this um, that have to do with um, both the internet and, and our consumers. The first is media fragmentation. So we now have um, millions of websites and there are almost as many blogs just in the past five years as there are websites um, for a total last count um, that I heard uh, combined um, number of web pages is somewhere in the nine billion page range. So there are simply um, more places for us to advertise online than we ever had from an offline standpoint. You know, we used to have three major networks, you know, and you had your local newspaper and so forth. So th those days are gone. That, that's probably obvious to everyone. Yet I'm amazed. I still have clients who um, are, are new clients who will say to us, um, you know, my boss is the kind of guy that, you know, when we, when we explore a new channel, we want to own it. You know, so this notion of owning the internet just blows me away. It's, it's, um, it's not going to happen. It can happen relative to your share of voice compared to your competitors. But if you think you're going to um, own the real estate of you know every relevant website out there that has to do with your product service, that's not going to happen. And the next thing has to do with concurrent life events. So there's a lot that is said about boomers. And frankly, um, uh, I'm of the mindset that a lot of it is bunk. I'll give you one example. So there's you know, there's a lot of people that focus on generational cohort type stuff. That is to say that there's there's something special about uh, the boomers um, that um, means we should treat them like differently, like aliens compared to every other consumer. And there are some unique aspects, you know, but one of the ones that kind of makes me laugh is the, the notion that, you know, they're all hippies um, and, you know, because they grew up in the Woodstock era. And just to debunk that a little bit, I want to share with you the average boomer was 12 years old when Woodstock happened. So they were still sitting at the kitchen table eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with no clue of what was going on out in that field. Um, one thing that is very important about boomers, and this has to do with not just when they were born, but how old they are at this point in history is the number of concurrent life events. So there's a variety of reasons for this, but in the United States, boomers are experiencing more concurrent life events than any other generation. That is to say that at any given time, 
Um, you've got boomers that may be um, looking for a new career, going back to school, having kids returning home, um, becoming grandparents. They might be becoming, be becoming par grand, uh, parents themselves. So they've got a lot of different things going on. And um, you know, when you're thinking about where you're going to advertise and what your marketing message should be, you need to take that into consideration. If for no other reason, um, then they're extremely busy. So at Immersion Active, we subscribe um, to these principles of human behavior and we say, look, we got to kind of get back to our roots and what's, what's at the essence here of how we connect with human beings. So the first part of our, our philosophy is that, uh, that we subscribe to, and this isn't something we made up, is that we all share some um, core needs. And the five core needs, there's other ones we subscribe to, like Maslow's hierarchy and so forth. But the main core needs that, um, that we subscribe to and we try to understand and meet with our clients' brands are identity, purpose, energy, adaptation, and relationship. And you can see a quick uh, you know, uh, definition here for each one of them. But what this illustration is trying to show you is that all the generational cohort stuff, if it was a glacier, that's the stuff above the water. This is the 90% the of the glacier under the water that truly motivates us as human beings. I don't care if you're 50 plus or 50 under. You know, the, these are the things. So we all have identity needs. We need to, we are self, uh, we are motivated um, with self-preservation behavior um, to define ourselves by what we do, what we purchase. We have purpose needs, which are very important for our, our consumers. We have energy needs, which are obvious. All of these are pretty obvious with the exception of adaptation, which is basically our need to continue to grow and learn and um, to cope. And so these are all really important. And one of the first things that we do when we bring on a new client is we try to understand where their brand meets or has the potential to meet these needs. So then you might be saying, okay, I, I get that, but then if you're doing that and you say that applies to everybody, then um, how is this specific to an older consumer or to a senior or a boomer? So then what we do is we apply different lenses and the lens is based on season of life. So based on the fact that we are focused on adults uh, 40, 50 plus, uh, we're generally dealing with the fall and winter of life. And you can see here the, um, you know, the different um, modes that we're in. And you know, this, um, this isn't hocus pocus or soft science stuff. I mean, this is based on the fact that we are all 99.9% uh, .9 the same from a DNA standpoint. And we all go through certain things, biologically speaking and psychologically speaking, um, at about the same time. We all generally uh, you know, learn to walk uh, uh, you know, about the same time. We start to seek the acceptance of others uh, and ultimately the companionship of someone special at about the same time. So there's certain things that we go through. So um, you're probably thinking, well, this kind of explains a midlife crisis or you know, different things. And, and it does to a certain extent. You can see here, um, how we transition through life. You know, the interesting thing, um, I'll, I'll pretend like I'm talking to you, Dennis. The interesting thing about uh, our book has been that if you look on Amazon, and I'm not trying to pitch you all, I'd be happy to send a complimentary copy to anybody who wants to take the time to send me a quick email. Um, if you look at uh, the reviews on Amazon, what's been really interesting is we have some great no noteworthy marketers, and even on the back cover of the book, who have talked about the book. But what fascinates them as much as the digital strategy side of it is what they learned about themselves in reading about the book. So it's just amazing to me that as marketers, as an industry, there are just so few MBA courses or, or marketing um, courses that really focus on human behavior. And, and that's, that's what this is all about. So moving on, the second tip I have for you is to think people, places, and things. So we've already talked about this notion that uh, you can no longer own um, all of the places um, that you might need to advertise or communicate, you know, your brand's message. Um, it's just, it's just impossible. I want to show you one other, a kind of quick um, 
make one other quick point here. There are a lot of niche sites out there that come and, and go, frankly, that are aimed at uh, corralling uh, older adults, whether it's boomers, seniors, both. And, um, and, and unfortunately, they haven't done so well. And this is important for you to know because this seems like the low-hanging fruit, right? Um, I'm, I'm going to guess that what most of you know about internet marketing includes, at the very least, um, well, you can buy some AdWords, right? And uh, people use Google a lot. Um, and then the other thing is, well, there's a lot of sites out there, you know, that are specific to just about everything. So if I find a site with, uh, you know, just for boomers, chances are I'm going to have good success on that. And I can tell you for a fact that you could string all these sites together and, and still not have a successful campaign. I see case after case of prospective clients coming to us and saying, you know, I ran a, camp I ran a banner ad campaign here or there and it just didn't work. And the, the biggest question we get as an agency is um, people want to, you know, us to, uh, people want to know where all these boomers and seniors are hanging out online as if there's some dark corner of the internet and we just need to shine a light on them. And, and that's not the case. These are all great sites. Um, uh, you know, Eons is still around and, and evolving and trying different things. It's a great piece of the puzzle, potentially, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, there's other great sites out there, like Third Age TBD was, I, I thought, one of the more um, effective ones in terms of making a, a truly meaningful connection with these consumers. And they've had millions, hundreds of millions of dollars um, dumped on them and, and have not um, not been a as successful as they need to be based on that, that investment. So I just add that as a word of caution. So then what does that mean? If there's more than places, then what are we looking for with regards to people and things? And what we're talking about there is, uh, let's take people. This isn't necessarily the, the pundits out there, but uh, this could be um, a small, uh, you know, a person in the Midwest who has a blog site about for women going through menopause. Um, and that exact example is one that we've had great success with in terms of advertising. And the reason is because she doesn't herd people together simply based on their age. Um, you know, don't think it always has to be the pundit. Uh, there is one of the most popular blogs on New York Times is called um, uh, The New Old Age and it's, uh, it's a great blog and it has a lot of activity uh, but it's not necessarily the, the place where you might have the most success or, or it, it may be. So don't always think that it's got to be the, uh, you know, the, the biggest names um, for that to make for a successful campaign for you. And then the other, the last part of this is the things component, which I think confuses people most. So in the world of Web 2.0, we're now kind of gradually transitioning to whatever Web 3.0 is going to be. Um, what we have is a very interoperable um, internet, such that the, the, the functionality on any given page um, might be coming from three different servers and from other websites. One, of the, one example of a thing might be a widget. So there might be widgets out there um, that would be a great place for you to insert your brand or your brand story or you know whatever you're trying to um, sell. So that I would ask you to keep that in mind and this will play out a little bit more as we keep going. Hey Dennis, you let me know how we're doing time-wise too, bud. I will. Um, we have, th this is a, a little more technical illustration of how this plays out for us. So to us, relevancy is based on meeting one of those uh, basic core needs in a very topical way and focusing on people, places, and things. And the way as, a, as an agency that we determine which one is more important than another, in other words, which blogger is more important than the other blogger, or which uh, website is more important for us or ads to be on than another website is based on the intensity of the exchange. So uh, most simply put, there's a lot of websites out there that are still a monologue. What we're looking for is an exchange where content is being shared. This doesn't have to mean that people are posting a ton of comments, although that is one indication that there's a high level of exchange, but that this stuff is being shared. So. 
at an advanced level um, in our company, we're using so a variety of social media monitoring tools to understand where uh, that intensity is greatest. Um, a lot of these tools are um, uh, readily available and they have free versions now for you to look at, whether it's uh, there's a, you know, Quantcast or Compete, and then there's some social media ones that you can use. So um, our book talks about this, these tools that you can use. And this is, you know, like I said, there's 9 billion pages out there and there's a, you know, uh, millions of people behind all of that that have a voice online. Uh, you need to figure out where you're going to place your chips and that's how you go about doing that. And we call those engagement clusters. Uh, good old Microsoft. So um, tip number three is to remove the obstacles. When we first uh, got into serving boomers and seniors online, what we found was that, uh, you know, before you go and spend thousands, tens of thousands, or millions of dollars driving traffic to your site, you sure as heck better have the obstacles out of the way. And this is pretty tactical stuff, but I wouldn't be uh, doing right by you guys if I didn't share this with you. So this is some data that hopefully will take the, um, the pressure of um, doing a little usability testing off of you. And what this shows, this is from Jacob Nielsen, what this shows is that if you were to sit down with just three people, and watch them go through your site, you would observe um, about 60% of the, the obstacles that are keeping people from doing business with you. So what I usually do when I'm doing my live presentations is I, is I ask, you know, have, how many people in this room have ever sat down and watched at least three people using their site? I usually have no hands. Um, two people, one person, there's usually a few people that have done one person, maybe more advanced marketers have paid to have people do some usability testing. There are some great resources out there now. One's called usertesting.com. Um, I believe that's the URL um, that takes a notion uh, or, or kind of uh, embraces this notion of um, wisdom of the crowds and for about $40 um, per participant, you can select the, the demographic um, and the, you know, basically the type of, of person that um, you're trying to target and, they, and then develop, they'll help you develop a quick script. This isn't hard to do, um, depending on how sophisticated you're trying to be. And um, it will deliver that test, record their user session, and deliver that back to you recorded. And if you want a, a really humbling experience, you could do this in about a half an hour tonight and you would start getting results back within 24 hours. And I would encourage everybody to do this before you did anything else. And then to, of course, implement those changes and recommendations um, so that people can start doing business with you. Tip number four is to define your stories. I'm never sure if that's you know, um, clear. Um, so when you're advertising online, it's very, very important, especially in a social media world and with the social web, for you to know there are two stories. The reason I put this picture in here from the music man, my 40-year-old wife, is a, a drama teacher and you know she's constantly producing these plays for which they're telling a story and they have control over the set and um, you know the plot and how things play out with the characters and and that's really cool and from a branding standpoint we all have the opportunity to do that so if you haven't sat down and written out what the beginning middle and end of your brand story is um, shame on you because a brand is about a promise and you need to know how that plays out but the second part of that story is one that's often forgotten or just isn't known about and that's what we call your interaction story so what is the, the story for which your brand story is being inserted into? This is really key. We have clients in the reverse mortgage business who have come to us thinking, believing that there isn't a trust problem when it comes to reverse mortgages. And, um, you know, all we need to do is go out and do, some, you know, let enough people know and do some lead generation, you know, straightforward lead generation, and we're off to the races. And context is everything with, with our consumers, and you need to understand there's a story being told. So I, I encourage everybody to sit down and jot down what's the beginning, middle, and an end to your brand story or to your campaign's um, story as told by your brand, 
and then draw a line down the middle of the page. Do some Google searches on your product, your category, uh, you know, your, your industry, maybe some of your competitors' names, um, and look at not just the websites, but what's being said in blogs, the comments that are being made maybe on Amazon about similar products or your products, and then write down what the actual story is. And that reflects um, part of the zeitgeist, and so that's a really important thing. Is you need to make sure that you're inserting your brand into the zeitgeist in a meaningful and trustworthy manner. Tip number five is winning landing rights. <clears throat> so there's been a fair amount of research here to suggest that, um, you know, um, let me back up a step. They always used to say, you know, you had just a couple of seconds to get, win somebody's attention with a direct mail piece. Well, on the internet, they say it's a fraction of a second, and with older consumers, it's even less. So, again, context is a factor, but really the big factor here to winning landing rights has to do with how our brains work as we get older. So, um, what happens, and this has been proven by um, some of the, you know, our ability to image the brain, is that as we um, move into the second half of life, and there's no sharp divide here, as we move into the second half of life, uh, we go from being either left brain, right brain, or right brain thinkers to being more whole brain thinkers. And so we need to take that into account when we're developing our campaign. So every marketer says you need to make an emotional connection. This is deeper than that, so I want you to consider this a little bit. Um, this goes deeper than that, but it is an emotional connection is what we're going for. And I'll give you a little um, quick case study here. One of our clients, when they first came to us about four years ago, they had a, a national pay-per-click company doing their, um, their online advertising. That, in other words, they were advertising on, on Google via AdWords, and they had landing pages. And these landing pages um, were geographically specific. So there was one for the West Coast, let's say, one for the East Coast. And um, when we came on board, we said, there's a problem here. These, these are very left brain kind of landing pages, and we didn't have the trust of the client yet. So uh, they said, well, prove it to us. And so we did a national test where we did an A-B split. And um, in the first version, we, had, we, we applied um, best practices with regards to developing landing pages. And if you don't know what a landing page is, it's simply a side door that's used for campaigns to funnel the user toward a transaction more quickly. So rather than getting directing them to your website and them getting lost on your website, it's usually very, very focused. So we, we use best practices. We had um, you know bullet points, features and benefits uh, above the fold, easily readable, you know, skimmable, and so forth. And then in the the other version, we developed a narrative. And this narrative, you had to scroll three times um, down the page to read it all. But it told a story, and um, there were a couple aspects of the story that are that are important. Stories in and of themselves make a great right brain connection. But beyond that, we engage the senses. Um, so you can see here right in the first paragraph, we were engaging a variety of senses, talking about, um, we say, growing up, we had dinner at my grandma's house every Sunday. We walked down three, uh, three blocks down the street to her house, pausing to see what kinds of new trees and shrubs the neighborhood had planted the week before. Midwest style roast beef, fresh bread, coleslaw, green beans and gravy every week. Somehow it never got old. And then it goes on to talk about being able to hear a relative playing the piano as you're walking in the door. These are things that are hard for us as human beings to ignore. They get to the heart of who we are, we start to um, these, you know, it, it engages the senses. So good storytelling, what goes into that is important. There's another aspect here um, that made this um, effective, and that was that um, it used a principle that we talk about in our book called conditional positioning. So we didn't talk about a situation so specific that you had to be that person to understand it, but we wrote a story instead that allowed um, a wider audience and hopefully from this generation to insert themselves. So I won't go on about this, but it's important for you to know that um, this the version B outperformed version A four to one. So um, it was incredible. And the, the company that 
um, was managing their PPC at the time, couldn't believe it and had made us go back and, and prove it and audit the results and so forth. So this notion, what, what we say, our mantra is lead with the right, follow with the left. So it doesn't mean that you have to ignore the features and benefits that your product or service has to offer. Just make sure that you win landing rights to start by engaging their senses. Storytelling is just one way to do that. <clears throat> Um, another great way here, and I can't present it um, uh, via webinar, but there's some video here uh, that dramatically improved um, the, the performance of, of this campaign. So video is um, very um, quickly being adopted by older consumers. As a matter of fact, it's most quickly being adopted by consumers over the age of 70. And there's a variety of reasons for that, but one of them is that um, they feel emotionally engaged um, by video. Okay, tip number six. Dennis, I assume you'll let me know how I'm doing here, bud, with regard to time. Step number six, um, pick the right tool for the job. So when it comes to social media, um, we see too many people out there just, you know, running after the next shiny object in the room. And it's, um, it's just not a good way to, to, to go. So I'm not sure if you know this, but I'll share it with you. This was... Um, been about a year and a half now. Uh, CNN reported that women over 55 are the fastest growing group on Facebook and that Twitter, in fact, is not being, um, you know, um, been popular with teens necessarily, but its popularity has been based on adults 45 plus. The problem, and, and so a lot of marketers that are trying to reach boomers and seniors are um, taking this and saying, okay, I just need to place ads there. And the problem is, it would be in my interest to tell you that you just need to go do this stuff and be on Facebook and be on Twitter. But the problem is there's no engagement there. And most of, of the uh, 50 plus users for both um, Twitter and Facebook as just two of the social networks have actually fallen off. Um, I think they say 80% of them never even um, completed their profile or, or really got engaged with Twitter in particular at all. So um, they're failing to see the reason. That's the problem. So this notion of mirroring engagement is one that we're going to talk about. So we have a saying internally, it's Twitter today gone tomorrow. So don't, don't be fascinated by the, the shiny object in the room. Even Facebook now with 500 million uh, users, that's impressive. But I have to tell you, we've lived through the dot-com days. Uh, about three years ago, I stood on a stage, one of our clients, and told you know 600 of of their clients that um, you know uh, if face if MySpace was a country, it'd be the third largest country. A year later, it was exactly the opposite. It was Facebook, and, and MySpace was all but gone. So be very very careful how much you invest in any one of these, and do it with um, intent and a plan. We'll talk a little bit about that because even if you are fairly disciplined and you get yourself, you know, you have a presence on most of these and you've uh, figured out how to do a screen grab and put their little icons in the bottom of your email or on your website, you'll never be able to keep up with all of them. There's just too many of them out there. So um, you need to do this with intent and understand where you're inserting yourself and, and the best way to do that from an engagement standpoint. It's tricky, I'll tell you, even with Facebook, we're getting ready to launch a campaign and uh, Facebook is changing once again the way that their fan pages work. And so even from a technical standpoint, you need to be prepared um, to move with what is ultimately a, a moving target. You need to be able to be agile and really understand what that means for your consumers. If you're really looking for, um, you know, the one thing, you know, from a social media standpoint that could have a great impact on your business. If you're not using email um, strategically with intent, with discipline, um, then don't even worry about Facebook or any of the others. Email is still the most popular activity for adults over 50 
and as you see here, is actually now being adopted more quickly by adults than younger adults. This too will change. There's a wave, you know, um, for which a 50 plus consumer generally is lagging behind a little bit a younger consumer. But that's the beauty of marketing to this group is you can kind of look and see what happened. But we still eat, we have a lot, a long way to go with regards to email. There's a couple of reasons. One, it, the, the stat that you see on the screen, but the second one is that most marketers um, are attracted to the shiny object in the room and so they're forgetting about email and they've left the email strategy behind so um, your opportunity to, to be really effective here with uh, drip campaigns um, you know campaigns that um, you know whether it's an e-newsletter or something um, it is really really powerful right now David Tip number seven uh, is to leverage word of mouth so at Immersion Active, that's at the heart of what we're doing, and that's because we know that boomers and, and seniors, um, but not as much as boomers, are very inclined to um, rely on word of mouth in terms of their purchase decisions. A quick stat here, boomers are asked for their opinion 90 times a year, 90% of the time they offer it, and the remarkable thing is that almost half of that time, those recommendations are online. And this surprises people a lot of times because they might say, well, I don't see that playing out. But you have to remember that word of mouth online plays out a lot of ways. It could be as simple as someone forwarding an email to a friend um, with a FYI or I thought you might be interested. So um, remember the, you know, can think about word of mouth a little bit more broadly. Number eight that I referred to a couple of minutes ago is mirror engagement. <clears throat> So Forrester did some research when they wrote a book called Groundswell for which they created uh, six different buckets that they put us in based on our social media engagement. So this is consumers that engage in some form of social media. How are they engaging? And you can see here, if you can see on your screen, the white line represents the general internet population and the yellow line represents adults, in this case 55 plus. So you can see that um, and, and realize this is only adults that are engaging in social media on some sort of a regular basis. You, you have less than, you have about 12% of them are content creators. Um, critics are about 28%, collectors 12%, joiners. But there's one category here that we observed or, or one mode of engagement that was left off here and that was um, this notion of sharing. Um, so while you know the common misconception is that these consumers aren't worth pursuing online because they might be online but they're just sitting you know um, it's like a dance when you're in middle school you know and, and and the boys are kind of on the right side and the girls are on the left side you know sitting against the wall. That, that's how our consumers are thought of in terms of their online engagement. That's not the thing they're just engaging in different ways. So many of you probably have taken some sales training um, if not through CSA and you, you're probably aware of this. This is the same kind of deal like you learned you know in sales training. You, you know when somebody leans into you you lean into them you know um, that kind of thing only from an online standpoint. David, we have a, here, about five minutes engage. at this point. This has been the key to both the initial success with social networks, but then also why people are falling off. So keeping in touch with family and friends is overwhelmingly the main reason that boomers in particular, but you'll see here um, overall, are, are online. But there are also other reasons they engage. It, it always surprises our clients when we make a recommendation to, to uh, advertise or, or sponsor a site like pogo.com, which is owned by EA Sports. It's a gaming site, but actually their largest audience is a, is a female over the age of 50. Online games are huge, and the level of engagement that's happening there is huge, which is important to us as well. So this is from eMarketer. If any of you are interested, I'd be happy to send it along. So that brings me to how you can mirror that engagement. And for us, the, one of the major objectives in any campaign that, that we deploy for our clients is to inspire sharing. So as a company, we're about helping people process their lives. Um, and the way that we do that is by m defining our brands 
um, story, beginning, middle, and end, understanding how that brand meets as many of those core needs as possible, and then inserting ourselves into those clusters that I defined before. So you can see a cluster here that plays out that's meeting adaptation needs. If you're familiar with anyone who takes care of an elderly loved one, um, they are very busy. They, um, uh, they, they don't even have time to look for resources to make um, their awesome responsibility more, more easy for them. And, you know, that's within um, caregiving as a, as a topic. We insert ourselves in there and then we find as many ways as possible for our client to not just put up banner ads or text ads, but to insert things um, that are helpful, that are going to help them figure out and get them where they're trying to go. So whether that's, you know, the fact that our, our client's written a book or that we developed a, a calculator that helps you determine if a, a certain job is right for you or um, if your mom truly does need help or if stress is affecting you to white papers. Um, we recently just, for this client in particular, um, deployed a, a series of videos. And video is very, very important, especially from a search engine optimization standpoint now. So this notion of sharing, if you have one takeaway, would be the thing I would highly recommend you focusing on. And sharing is more than just placing um, some icons on the page that say share this. So first off, if you are going to place those icons, you need to make those friendly uh, for an older consumer and test it. With There's a lot of tools out there, one's called Add This. And you know they, they give the user a million different options or ways to share. Only 2% of which are relevant to an older consumer. So um, make that those share tools friendly is the first thing. The second thing is think about incentivizing sharing. So there, we often say there's three levels of sharing. People share because something, something is simply share worthy. So maybe you have a video that is just, you know, um, really touches the heart or tells a great story or something. So that would be simply share worthy. There are soft shares. So um, maybe somebody shares because they have the opportunity to be the fan of the week on your fa Facebook page. And then there are what we call hard shares, and hard shares usually have some monetary value associated with them. So, you know, share this with five friends and um, be entered to win a, a camcorder. Or, you know, tell us your story and be entered to win a camcorder. So those are the three different levels of sharing. Don't think that just putting little share this icons or forward this email is going to do it. And then lastly, well, hold on, I guess we have two more slides. Um, ultimately, what we're encouraging here is um, for marketers and you, whether you're a salesperson or a marketer or a business owner, to think like a publisher. And I know this isn't easy to do. I mean, and, and, but remember, the tribe you're trying to reach isn't huge. So instead of focusing on the 95%, you know, focus on the 5%. And hit them, you know, this is sophisticated and this client has money to do this, but it can be as simple as, you know, an email a week for you that helps that tribe and positions you as the leader of, of that movement and stay focused on, on the topics that are relevant to that movement and you, you will be successful. Then my, my last tip for you for the day is to measure your success. Remember, it's about engagements, not clicks. So you know, as a result of placing that one YouTube video on my site, how much more time did people spend on my site as opposed to what's my click-through rate? Focusing on the click-through rate is, would be kind of like um, a general and a, and a battle focusing on the bayonet thrust, we say. It's, it's important, but it's not what's going to win the battle for you. And then make sure this, that the way that you're measuring your success is aligned with where you're trying to go as a company. So I'm not sure um, how meaningful that is to, to this audience, but um, you know, uh, make sure that the, the tribe that you're building is going to take your company, your brand, where you want to go. So this is a little hard not knowing um, where my audience's head is at. This has been incredibly successful for us. I think this is my last um, slide here. Just to show you, even in this down economy, the, the ideas that, uh, you know, the tips that we presented, that I presented today, um, have uh, increased, in this case, our clients' inbound leads by five times at a, at a time when actually traffic to their website and their competitors' website went down as a result of the economy. So this isn't all about having a great website and then forgetting to advertise it. You know, 
I feel like we've, we've gotten past that. So you, you, everybody here understands you, you need more than a good website. You need to drive people to that website. But now I want you to think beyond that website. I want you to think about putting portable pieces of information out there in the internet that people can share that helps meet their needs and is focused on a topic because that's what's going to make it relevant and um, where there's a high level of intensity in exchange.